Benvenuti a Memorandum, oggi è il 30 di maggio, sono le 6 del pomeriggio qui in Italia, ma io sono collegato con gli Stati Uniti con il professor Isaac Calderon Adizes. Il professor Adizes è nato il 22 ottobre del 1937 a Scopie, nella Macedonia del Nord, ha 50 anni di esperienza ed è autore di 26 libri su un tema che lo rende eh, importante a livello mondiale, che è la metodologia Adises, proprio porta il suo nome, per la trasformazione eh, delle organizzazioni. La rivista Leadership Excellence lo ha identificato come uno dei 30 pensatori più autorevoli a livello globale sul tema della leadership. The Holmes Report lo ha inserito nel 2017 nella lista dei più efficaci comunicatori al mondo, insieme a Papa Francesco, Angela Merkel e il Dalai Lama, insignito di 21 lauree honoris causa della diversità di 11 paesi. Nel 2010 la medaglia d'onore di Ellis Island, che è una decorazione concessa negli Stati Uniti d'America da parte della National Ethnic Coalition of Organizations, che ha lo scopo di rendere omaggio agli immigrati o discendenti di immigrati che hanno contribuito al benessere degli Stati Uniti, membro dell'International Academy of Management e già professore dell'Università della California, la nota UCLA, fondatore e amministratore delegato della Dizes Institute, che è noto in molti paesi per il programma che porta il suo nome e che ha erogato, egli stesso assieme ai suoi collaboratori, a eh, centinaia di clienti pubblici e privati. Il professore tiene conferenze in quattro lingue, fino ad oggi è apparso davanti a circa 250.000 manager in 52 paesi. Il suo libro Corporate Life Cycle è nella top 10 dei best business books del Library Journal. Il professore è sposato, ha sei figli, ormai grandi, vive a Santa Barbara in California, suona la fisarmonica, fa yoga pratica la meditazione heartfulness. Benvenuto in Italia. Which are, if they exist, uh, links you have with our country, with Italy? Oh, definitely. My name, Adizes, is a variation of Adige, because when the Jewish people settled in Italy after they were expelled from Spain in 1492, because by the Inquisition and they settled in Italy, they took names of places in Italy. So anybody that has a last name, that's the name of a place like Romano, Viterbi, and in my case, Adige, they're Jewish people that settled in Italy. And my family lived in Verona for 300 years. My grandmother's name was Venezia Adige. So you cannot get more Italian than that. Then we moved with the Venetian Empire down to Dubrovnik and from there to Kosovo which was the capital of the transit between Asia and Europe. Then in the Second World War, we escaped from Macedonia into Albania, which was at that time occupied by the Italians. And we went to Albania because we wanted to be under Italian regime and not under German regime because the Italians were more tolerant to the Jewish people than were the Germans. So we were hiding under the Italians. There is something interesting about Italian culture, in my judgment. First of all, you just do not like to be integrated. You are more independent, very independent. You are not together. I just found out, which I did not know, that you have many languages in Italy. You are not just Italian language, you know. You, you don't even communicate with each other, not to mention the separation between the North and the South. So the biggest problem, I think, that I realize is the lack of I, if you know my model PAI. There is no I, there is no integration here. And when you are not integrated, a lot of the energy gets wasted. Another thing that's missing is probably some order. A, uh, when you don't have A and I, the glue is not there to put the society together. And when the glue is not there, it manifests itself in something called disintegration. You're continuously disintegrated. You change prime ministers like people change shirts, you know. There is a lot of change and there is no stability, there is no continuity, there is no integration, which produces insufficient results. And the, the lack of A is also manifested in the quality of the products. I, for instance, I worry buying an Italian product because I know it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. But if you look at it, you will probably break down just from looking at it. You don't have enough order, systematization, attention to details, organization, integration to become what you could be 
a real successful society in a country. Let's suppose that Italy is an, is an organization uh, with this problem, disorder, disintegration. Which, which are the most urgent things we should do in order to improve the situation? You need another Garibaldi, I think. Garibaldi is still in need for Italy. He did not finish uniting Italy. Unfinished job. And what the leaders that you get, you know, Berlusconi was a big E, you know, entrepreneurial, creative, you know, huha muha bua, but he's not an integrator. I have not seen yet, from what I observe, you know, I don't know enough, but I have not noticed from your leadership enough people that are integrators. You got Mussolini that was integrating it, but under a very wrong premises, fascistic premises. You need an integrator of humanistic premises. And I think that's what's missing here. An integrator that can motivate the people to get together, to work together, to improve the quality of the work, get the trains to work on time, but not with power, not with fascism, not with destructive uh, mission, but with a constructive mission. And that's what's missing. What communism and fascism does, they do integrate in the wrong way. Look at my hand. What do you see? Different figures together. You go to any church, you will see that the saints are standing like this. And the Pope stands like this. Why are they standing like this? What is this? This is the message. Be different together. Communism and fascism makes us together this way. We are together all the same. They don't allow diversity. And that paralyzes the country. So what Italy needs is not to discontinue the diversity like Mussolini tried to do, like communists tried to do. No, 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 no. Integrate diversity. We accept each other's difference, like in a marriage. Don't be like me. I love you being different because I benefit from your difference. So we need to keep Italy differentiation alive, but still work together. The problem in Italy is that this is not this. This is Italy. What we need is this Italy. And how do you do this, make it happen? You need this finger. Look at this finger. What is the role of this finger? By the way, it's not a finger. These are fingers. This is not a finger. It's called a hand maker. This is a finger that makes a hand. If you don't have a thumb, you don't have a hand. What Italy needs is a thumb. Not to eliminate differences, which fascism and communism try to do. You go to the other extreme. You go from this to this. No, no, no. From this to this, for which you need this. You need an integrator, an integrator, leadership of integrator. You consulted uh, several prime minister leaders of countries. Do you approach them the same way? The methodology is the same, but the tools in the methodology is a lot of tools. So I usually, when I meet with the prime minister, I, I, I ask him, you know, what keeps you awake at night? And I usually do it in four eyes. Because when they have a republic, they, are, they behave totally differently. And when I listen, I know then using my tools, PAI, which vitamin is missing. Because those are four vitamins that makes a system healthy. And like I told you, Italy misses A and I. You're very P-oriented and very E-oriented, but your A stinks. And because of that, the quality of your product is always suffering, which is different from the German product. They're very A, you know. You know you can rely on that product with your life. So I watch which vitamin is missing culturally, culturally. And then I develop a methodology. I have a whole program how to make that vitamin, quote unquote, be injected into the society. COVID-19 is not the first pandemic. We have had a lot of pandemics in our history. The earliest that I know about was the cholera in the Middle Ages. But then we had the next one and the next one and the Spanish flu and the SARS and the MED and now Ebola. And... But notice something very interesting. That the time span between one pandemic to the other is getting shorter and shorter. Between the cholera and the Spanish flu, 300 years. Between SARS and, and, and COVID-19, 20 years. What tells me is that the next pandemic is around the corner. 
if we think that COVID is this is it and we are going to go back to normal, don't hold your breath. The next pandemic is around the corner. It's already happening. The mutations are already happening. You can see that. Why is the pandemic is getting shorter and shorter in the time scale? Here it is why. What is pandemic? A crisis. How is a crisis created? And why is it getting in time shorter and shorter time span? It is why crisis happens in a company, in a society, in a human body, in a family, any crisis. Everything we know is a system. A country is a system. Your body is a system. A company is a system. The universe is a system. A system is by definition composed of subsystems. In a company, you have the marketing subsystem, the production subsystem, the human capital subsystem, the financial subsystem. And every subsystem is sub, 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 subsystem, all the way down to the nano. When there is change, the subsystems do not change at the same speed. Some change faster than others. Marketing changes faster than production. Production changes faster than accounting. Accounting changes faster than the human element. Human element takes forever to change. Because of that, there are gaps in the system. It's called disintegration. All problems are manifestation of disintegration caused by change, period. So if you want to know you have a problem in your marriage, you have a problem with your car, you have a problem with your company, you have a problem in Italy, it's caused by disintegration that was caused by change. Change causes disintegration, is manifested by problems. When you don't treat the problem, what happens? Change continues. The problem becomes bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes a crisis. Crisis is an untreated problem for a long time. In your marriage, in a company, in a society. COVID is an untreated problem. It was not born yesterday. All these pandemics is an untreated problem. What is the untreated problem? If all problems are caused by disintegration, what is the solution? Integration. And we have not yet get the message that the globe is one big system and our borders are artificial. Humanity is one big system. And because we are still disintegrated, we're allowing COVID to penetrate. It came from China to Italy because in the Northern Italy, you have a lot of Chinese companies and Chinese influence. What is a pandemic trying to tell us? You are one. Start working together. And the pandemic will continue until the whole world will be vaccinated. We try to vaccinate our own country, but you cannot control it. You cannot control the borders. The message is we need to learn to be one. And how can we cooperate together? We have not done it yet. The United Nations is a forum for discussions. We don't have yet a forum of working together as one global society. And until we develop that, the pandemics will continue coming. Now, what is a pandemic manifestation of? Technology subsystem is changing faster than our human physiological subsystem can adapt to. It took us several million years to lose our tail. We still have a tailbone. The body adapted, but it took many years to adapt. Today, with the technology moving so fast, our body is not catching up. So those viruses that exist found a very fertile body to penetrate because our body is not capable to adapt to change fast enough. We need to learn how to control the change. The change is outpacing our capability to adapt. We're talking about cloning. We are talking about genetic engineering of our vegetables, of our fruit. Our body does not know that. That's a totally new fruit. Does not adapt. So if you want to know what we need to do as a society is slow down and go back to the origins. Go back to simple life. That's why in America today, it's a big fad, plant-based, plant-based diet. 
go back to plant-based, not eat the, the meat which is full with antibiotics. The body cannot adapt, cannot adapt. You have to go back to simple life. Your daily diet. Unfortunately, I talk more than I do. I want to admit. I try to live what's called a vegan diet. No salt, no sugar, no animal products. None of animal products. That's it. So a lot of vegetables, a lot of legumes, a lot of fruit. Simple life. The less people handle it, the better. If humans touched it, I don't want it. I want it to be simple from the nature. Then that's how you keep healthy. We are, we are destroying ourselves. We are destroying ourselves. I call humanity the cancer of, we are cancerous to the environment. So the less involvement of humans in my food, the better. The less process, the better. And going through your, your life, change is the, the word you put in the middle of your uh, analysis. Change, uh, you say, is a destiny for mankind, but still people are afraid uh, to face change, to cope with change. They are afraid uh, of change. Why? What is change? Change means something new is happening. New. That's change. To me, change is like walking down the street until you come in a foreign country to an intersection. Change. I have a new a phenomenon in front of my eyes. Now I need to decide what to do. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go back? What do I do? That is called decision-making under uncertainty. I don't know, because it's something new. Always people say, I don't have enough information. You're absolutely right. You don't have enough information. You will have the information only after the fact, the new fact has been addressed. Then you know, everybody is smarter on Monday morning about the soccer game that happened on Sunday. When you're playing, uh, you don't know, because there is uncertainty. That's why you scratch your head and you say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Some people say, I'm not going to go left. I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to go right. I'm going to go nothing. I'm not going to decide. What they don't realize is they just decided. They just decided not to decide, which means they decided to stay where they are. And that could be the worst decision you're going to take. Why? Because even if you are on the right road, if you don't move, a truck might come and run you over because you don't control the change. The world does not stop and say, since you do not you connect us decide, everybody is going to stop and do nothing until you decide. No, the world continues. A truck is going to show up. So the first way we don't like it is we have to make a decision. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go back? Do I stay in place? What do I do? What do I do? That's the re first reason why we are, really don't like change. Because I have to make a decision under uncertainty. The other reason is, once you implement your decision, go left, go right, whatever, you're taking risk, it might not work. Maybe you took the wrong road, maybe you took the wrong decision, maybe you're doing the wrong thing. So we are really do not like change because we have to decide and we have to take risk. That's why people say, don't change. Don't do anything. I don't need to decide. I don't need to take risk. But they don't realize it by not deciding that they are deciding. And maybe it is the biggest risk they are taking of all the risk because they are not acting. The answer is, because the world is changing, you cannot escape. You cannot run away from changing. You cannot run away from taking decisions and taking risk. You cannot run away from it. You're like, like the bird that sticks his head in the, in the sand. I... Professor, in a lab story, sometimes that doesn't work. One of the partner is not able to split, to say bye. But not choosing to do this in that moment, it seems not very painful because the other person in his belief or in her belief doesn't know that. Is it a different situation or it, it is also connected to the problem of changing many times we don't act because we believe 
it will be okay. It will be changing. It will be taking care of itself. You know, maybe if I wait a little bit longer, maybe, you know, if I only do this, maybe if I do that, because we don't really like to bite the bullet. Making a major change is major taking uncertainty and major risk. You might be right. You might be right. Maybe the situation would be better and you don't have to do anything. You just wait and let it, you know, heal by itself. Don't, don't interrupt. But maybe not. Now the question is, how do I know the difference? There is the prayer of Niebuhr. He says, God, grant me the courage to change what I can change, the serenity to accept what I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. This is not easy. The wisdom to know the difference. So what I do is, when you don't know, talk to somebody who is wise, who has been in this movie before. Don't make a decision alone. Maybe somebody has been to this. The difference between being intelligent and being wise. An intelligent knows how to get out of a hole. A wise person knows how not to fall into the hole by looking at other people who have been in the hole already. So talk to somebody. Don't be alone. Talk to somebody wise you trust and say, what do you think? So they can give you some advice. So don't, don't try to solve all the problems by yourself. So the story that each story is different uh, from any uh, other story is partly true. Partly true. Your life was not very easy. Do you agree that suffering uh, was a constant lens that you had to look at the world uh, through? The word suffering is too strong, you know. Suffering, you know, pain. I think the better word, because not all people suffer, but all people have problems. Suffering is a problem that you suffer from. What I learned in my life is, I had a lot of problems when you say a lot of suffering. Second World War, I was in a concentration camp and then I actually was hungry four times in my life. I know what suffering is, but not all people suffer, but all people have problems. So the question is, are problems a good thing or a bad thing? Which is the same thing question you ask me, suffering good or bad? You can convert a problem to be an opportunity. And I will tell you a story where I learned this from. I was invited by an Italian rich man to come to the American Cup. American Cup is a competition 12 meters boats, uh, sailboats. America has never lost to any foreign country in the competition. It's called the American Cup. And an Australian came to compete against Americans and he invited me to the finals because he used my methodology. And he won. And he gave me a big plaque, thank to Dr. Adises. And we are sitting having dinner. And the telephone rings and he goes out to answer the telephone. He comes back, very rich guy. And his face is a little bit long. So I said, uh, Alan, what happened? Oh, you know, I just found out I lost $20 million. Wow. How does it feel to lose $20 million? He says, I'm a lucky man. I said, you're a lucky man to lose $20 million. How can that be? He says, well, look, I look at the life this way. I'm a lucky man. I took a course in the University of Life where the fee is $20 million to take that course. Not too many people can afford the $20 million fee for a course. I'm a lucky guy, I can afford. Now the question is, did I learn from this course? Did I pass the exam or did I fail the exam? What did I learn from this $20 million course? So because of that, I changed in my theory, in my lectures, I say, whenever you have a problem, whenever you are suffering, don't ask yourself the question that everybody asks. Why do I suffer, God? God, why did you give me this problem? The word why will get you nowhere. As a matter of fact, a little kid can make a Nobel Prize winner look like an idiot with asking the same question three times. Why? And the Nobel Prize will explain, say, why? Explain, why? By the fourth time, the guy is going to say, I don't know. There is no end to why. Forget why. Exchange the word why with a synonym. What for? 
which is true in all languages. I'm sure it's in Italian too. Por que, para que, in Spanish. In Hebrew, le ma, za, sto, in Slavic languages. All languages, why is what for? So if you ask yourself the question, not why, but what for do I have this suffering? Wow. It opens you up to learning. What for? What does God want me to learn from this suffering? What can I? So the more problems you have, the wiser you become. So many people ask me, how come you are so philosophy and you have so many wisdom? I say, because I had a lot of problems in my life from which I learned a lot. Every time I have a problem, I ask myself, what for do I have this problem? I look for problems. I travel all over the world, consulting to companies, to prime ministers to solve problems. Because every problem, you learn something from it. The more problems you have, the wiser you become. I like people that have a lot of experience that shows me the strength of their character, how they solve the problems. So suffering is good if you learn from it. Suffering is bad if you just sit there and cry your heart out and do nothing. You mentioned before that uh, when the problem uh, uh, is new for you or you don't know what to do, it could be a good idea to ask somebody who was already in this movie. Which people you had in your life that were there, your companions, that inspired you? I have some uh, that stand out, but I learned from everybody. I learned from a truck driver. I learned from children. You learn a lot from children, my God, because they're so clean. They tell you things that somebody else will not tell you. In my theory of organizational life cycle, how to predict problems, I learned by watching the rocks in Grand Canyon. I said, wow, rocks have life cycle. Old rocks, new rocks. Organizations have also a life cycle, and that's how I developed my theory. So I, I, I try to learn from everything. I learn at everything. I said, oh, what does it mean? What can I learn from it? The three people that stand out, however, stand out. They're the people that I look up because they have characteristics that I don't have. So I can't do that. I say, wow, I wish I was like him. So I try to emulate them. One of them is my friend from high school who is fantastically humanistic, helping the world, but very humble. You see, you told me all about my achievements, which unfortunately I have to put it in my curriculum when they introduce me, but I wish I was like him. The shorter is your vita, the better you are. I look up to him and he says, I wish I was like him. That's the first guy. And he's very, always contributing to society, always trying to see how he can help. And he's a doctor, Rafi, president of Physicians for Human Rights in Israel is Jewish and Arab doctors to go to all the villages in the occupied areas and help the people there, free medical help. He's the only one who is allowed into Gaza to go and do surgeries that the Gaza doctors cannot do to save lives. He's to me, my model. He was a personal physician to Shimon Peres, the president of Israel. The other guy is one of my clients and he moved to the United States, he invested in some real estate and he lost all his money. Everything he had, he lost. So years later I met him and he was quite successful already. He had another real estate development. So I asked him, you know, how did you get out of being bankrupt to be so successful like this? And he gave me something which I keep it as a mantra. He said, there are three assets the human being can have. Your family, your health, and your friends. If you have the three, you will always survive. If you lose health, lose your family, lose your friends, now you are bankrupt. Usually with the crisis, they start fighting the family. Why did you do that? You shouldn't have done that, ta, ta, ta. Family falls apart. He kept his family together. He kept his health together. He was going, he lost everything. He was bankrupt. He will exercise every day and watch his health. And then his friends came to his help, gave him money, started all over again, and he's very successful. Too. The biggest asset we have is our health, family, and our friends. And we don't pay attention to this. We always pay attention to something else. Uh-uh. That is a platform that you should never lose. 
And the third one is a really a guru in India that I go and visit periodically. That is the guru of heartfulness. And he taught me about love. He said, love is a muscle. You have to exercise it. You have to feed it. You have to strengthen it. Otherwise, it atrophies. So my muscles were very weak. Start building your muscles. Love is a muscle. And then I said, wow, he's right. Because some years before that, I was working with a client and I was trying to schedule it. When are we going to meet together? And I said, what about March 15? And he said, no, 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 I cannot. I'm on my honeymoon. I said, what honeymoon? I just had dinner with his wife the night before. When did he get divorced and remarry, you know, overnight? I mean, this is California, but this was too fast, you know? He says, oh, you don't understand. On the anniversary of my honeymoon, every year we have a honeymoon because one honeymoon is not enough for a lifetime of marriage. You have to feed love. Don't take it for granted because if you don't feed it, it atrophies. And that I keep it also as a mantra in my life. It's really simple in a way. Uh, Antonio, now you said something very important that should not be let pass. It's simple. Simple is powerful. We live in a world of academic. I didn't like the academic. I was a professor at the university. If it's not complicated, it's too simple. Read the articles that they write only Five people can understand what they're talking about. And I made it a mantra in my life to make things simple. And it's not, it's very complicated to make things simple. And it's very simple to make things complicated. So I work very, very, very hard to make things simple. Because when it's simple, now you can implement them. Now you know what you're talking about. Now it's powerful. When it's complicated, you can make it worse than it is. We had a call a few weeks ago in order to, to get to know each other and to, to plan uh, this uh, interview. And you told me the importance of scheduling properly, budget versus actual. Can you summarize uh, why it's so important to put there in your calendar? Time is endless. It started with the Big Bang. It will go for God knows how much longer. Energy is not endless. We assume the time and energy are endless. They are not. Our days, and we don't know how many. I've been just doing myself an accounting of it. I'm 83 years old. My father died when he was 86. So if I'm going to follow my father, I have three years to live. Let's assume I'm healthier. I will live double, six years, seven years. Do you know it's fixed? Seven times 360 is about 2,000 something number of days. I have only 2,500 days left. When you really realize that you say, wait a minute, what the <laughs> hell is going on here? Every day that passes, you will not come back. It's a fixed number. I even suggest get yourself a cent clock, you know, that when the cent is going through, put it mm -hmm. up there just to remind you, time is passing, my friend. Life is going. We don't do that. Why? Because we don't want to think about death. It's too scary. Because we don't think about death, we don't think about the days are given, fixed. So we live as if life is forever and we will live forever. And what happens? We waste time on nonsense, on things that don't matter. I even wrote a blog calling it why you should live like you are dead. Because when you are dead, nothing matters. So when you are alive, ask yourself, does it really matter? Not everything matters. So really devote your limited number of days on earth on something that really matters. And what matters? What will survive your death? And what will survive your death? Love. Are you loved? Have you loved? If you lived all your life without love, what have you left behind? What people will remember you is for the love they felt towards you or the love that you gave them to your wife, to your children, to your family, to your customers, to people that you loved. And we don't pay attention to that. We leave this as a last item on our agenda. So when you plan your agenda, you should do it like you plan your money because you have a limited number of days. What percentage of time do you want to give to love? Loving yourself. 
Spend time with yourself. That's why meditation is so important. Spend time with yourself. Time that you like to listen to good music. Time that you like to read your book. Time for yourself. That's why so many women are upset because they have so many chores of the house. They're taking care of the children, taking care of the husband. They don't have time for themselves. Wrong. You need time for yourself and you have to put it in your calendar. Between this hour and this hour, it's time for myself. Sorry. Myself. To integrate myself. To love myself. Get up in the morning. Take care of yourself. Then, schedule time to spend with your spouse. Alone. Not with friends. No. You and your spouse alone. Go to a nice restaurant. Look each other in the eye. Reconnect. The same thing you should do it when you go to sleep. No computers in the bedroom. No iPhones in the bedroom. No television in the bedroom. So that you can talk to each other. Reconnect. Love each other. It has to be scheduled. Because you go to sleep early. She goes to sleep late. Or, or the reverse. No time to be together. No, 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 no. Rules. We go to sleep together. And we spend time together. And no television. We reconnect. It's not strange that marriages. After seven years of marriage. They don't know each other. They didn't spend any time knowing each other. Then you spend time with your children. Not all children together. One child at a time. Schedule it. This day is your time. This day is your time. This time is your time. Because every child has a different need. So everybody has his own needs. Quality time with the child. Now that you take care of the family, do you want to have extended family? Once or twice a year, we have extended family get together. And you go from the inside out. Schedule time for love for integration, for relating to people that you love, for your friends, health, integration. Health is integration. Integrating yourself for exercising. You have to schedule it. Most people, what do they do? The opposite. They work very hard. If time is left, I'm going to spend time with my children. No, 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 you're having it upside down. Because what you do, work, does not matter. Nobody will remember it when you die. Love, everybody will remember when you die. So I schedule it first. Integration of yourself, your family, extended family, friends. Put it in the calendar. Then time for getting organized. Organizing your paperwork, organizing your budget, organizing your house, organizing your business. Then time to learn something new. So that you're always better. What can you learn? So you schedule the time and check it every month. Like you do with a budget. What did you budget the money? Did you spend the money according to the budget or not? Prime ministers don't have time to go to the bathroom. They're so busy. You would not believe it how busy they are. I had privilege to have access to the schedule. Of President Nixon, all is scheduled every 15 minutes. Go do this, go do this, go do this, go do this. They don't have time to think. Maybe they think at night when they go to sleep because they're unbelievably busy. And then they're busy according to pressures. And I said, Stop. What's most important for this country? Give me the five top things. Now schedule time for this top five. Foreign affairs, we're having problems, okay? I'm going to give it so much X percentage of my time for foreign affairs. Y percentage of my time for health, COVID. So now you allocate time to which ministries are you going to pay attention to? Otherwise, you are being driven around by crisis from one crisis to the other, and you're really not managing. The problems are managing you rather than you're managing the problems. A short answer about your wife. You have six children from Nurit. What still is there from the woman you met so many years ago? It's so nice that you smile. I'm smiling because she's changing every day. I'm discovering an, another part of her I did not know before. So it's so beautiful. I'm exploring Africa, you know, every time I discover another lake, you know, somewhere. It's very alive. And she's at a lot of trouble because she constantly criticizes me. And at the beginning, I used to be very upset. Then I realized, what for am I having this trouble to become a better person? Every spouse is a psychotherapist to the other spouse. We are psychotherapists to each other. We try to help each other become better. 
So don't fight it. Try to be better. So I learn from her. She learns from me. She's not the same woman I met and I'm not the same man she met. We are still growing. We are still growing. And the more we are growing, the more we are loving. I love her now more than I loved her when I met her because I learned so much. I would not be today who I am without her because she let me be. I work very hard. I work 14 hours a day. She lets me be. And I let her be. And I think that kind of a freedom to be, don't try to be like me. Don't try to live up to my expectations. Why don't you do what I expect you to be? In Hebrew, we call it Ezer Keneged, a good wife, a, a valiant wife is Ezer Keneged, which means she's helpful against. When you lean on a, on a, on a, on a table, you see, it's working against you. Do you realize if it was not going against you, you will fall. She's against me. And that's how I'm learning. That's how she's supporting me by being a telling me, no, did you think about this? Did you think about that? Wait a moment, what are you doing? She's against, but it's helpful. It's a helpful against. It's not being against without being helpful. A relationship is constructive in marriage, in a company, in a country, when it's based on mutual trust and respect. If you don't trust your spouse, then when she's against, it's an annoyance, and it's upsetting. But if you respect them and you trust them, now you're learning. So what makes a successful system, what makes a successful country is mutual trust and respect. And in a marriage, when there is no mutual trust and respect, time to go home and get divorced. But you have to feed mutual trust and respect, like love. Because what is absolute mutual trust and respect is love. Absolute mutual trust and respect is love. You have to feed love, you have to muscle love, you have to feed mutual trust and respect. You have to build respect, you have to build respect, you have to build trust. And if you do that, your marriage is successful, your company is successful, your country is successful. Can I ask you to tell me about the photo which is behind you, where I see a lot of faces? I have several pictures. The one above there is me and my wife. Behind my head is her picture when I met her. Then you have this side, a picture of the, I got an award of the top 10 communicators in the world. Yes. yes. And here it is. You see, here is the Pope. And here is me. It is Dalai Lama. And it's Bloomberg, Angela Merkel. And the worst communicators in the world are here. The guy from North Korea, Putin. And so I'm in good company. I have a few questions more, if I may. Sure, go ahead. So we should move from more is better to better is more. We cannot run uh, spending our uh, limited days trying to get more and more and more. First of all, to understand that it does not apply to everybody. If you are an underdeveloped country and you're starving to death and you don't have enough food to eat, more is better. <laughs> Just go get yourself more food. You have to improve the economic conditions of the country, the economic conditions of your family. But at a certain point, more is not better. Why? I think it's true for anything, you know. When you exaggerate, it, now it's really hurting you. The transition, let me explain the transition. If you look at the progress of civilization, of humanity, realize what's happening. At the beginning, according to Darwin, we were chimpanzees. And the strongest chimpanzee was the leader. Then we became a nomadic society. And we were going from tree to tree. And the best hunter was the leader strongest hunter was the leader. Then we became an agricultural society. And the person with the most sheep, most cows, most land was the leader. What is a common denominator? Muscle, strength. The more, the better. And by the way, that permeated our behavior many thousands of years thereafter. Colonialism follows the same principle. The more land, the more resources I have, the better. That was their whole idea of colonialism. Then came the Industrial Revolution. And now the brain got into the act. Now you have to plan and you have to organize and you have to hire and to fire and to do budgets. The brain got involved. So now you have brain and, and power together, muscles and brain. Today we live in what's called the post-industrial society for developed countries. Pay attention that muscle is not that important anymore. The biggest transportation company in the world does not own one car, Uber. The biggest hotel company in the world do not own one hotel, Airbnb. What do they own? A computer information, capability to handle information. What is Google doing? Accumulating information. 
what is Facebook doing? Accumulating information. The brain is now the most important factor. Now notice something very important. The more brain, the better. The bigger computer, the better. The more powerful computer, the better. The brain is getting out of the way. It's being replaced by a computer, by artificial intelligence. So what is the future of mankind? The heart. And heart is not the more, the better. The better, the more. The better your relationship. The better is your love. The better is your health. And I think we are in the intersection. Civilization is at the intersection. If we continue with more is better, more powerful brain and more powerful muscles, with no heart, Nazi Germany was not a fluke in the history of mankind. Brainy people, powerful people with no heart. How could they burn little children alive? No heart. To be powerful in our brain and powerful with our muscles, atomic bombs, nuclear bombs, very, very, very smart, no heart. That is Nazi Germany. That is our future. Unless we develop our heart, and heart means better relationships. What do I do now on a country level? We should change our measurement for developed countries. I'm not talking about developing, developed countries. Don't constantly measure yourself by the GNP, gross national product. How is our economic growth? What percentage of economic growth? Wrong number. It's one of the numbers. Okay, good number, but one of the numbers. We should now start measuring health, crime, divorce rate, suicide rate, quality of life measurements, redirect our resources to quality of life. Not necessarily bigger house, more love in the house, not necessarily a more expensive car, not more, better. We should change our measurements of success on a country level, on a company level, measure, repeat sales. Are your customers coming back? Here is an analogy that we should not forget. You have a restaurant. If people come to eat in your restaurant once and never come back, how successful is this restaurant going to be? Are they coming back? In your marriage, if your spouse had a choice, would he or she come back? If they do have a choice, they would leave, that tells you something that the marriage is not working. So ask yourself quality of life, find measurements of quality of life. You said time for ourselves, time for myself. You listen to music, you meditate, you do exercise. Uh, why meditation for you is the uh, most important way of having time for yourself? First of all, I tried many types of meditations, many, many, many. None of them worked for me. I just could not sit quiet. I could not stop moving. Just my body was not taking it. I, I could not stop. And then a friend of mine told me that he found a meditation that I might like. I asked him, what is it? He says, it does not focus on a candle. It does not focus on the third point. It does not focus on your breathing. It focuses on the heart. I am in. I am in. Because of the Second World War, I told you, I closed my heart. I wanted to open my heart. Before I die, I wanted to open my heart and really love and feel love. So I said, I'm in. So I want to study, you know, to learn how to focus on heart. And I discovered something, wonderful meditation. Wonderful meditation. What is it so good about it? I get a lot of insights about life, about things that I will not get any other way. I connect myself with something which is called absolute wisdom. Something bigger than myself. When the meditation is over, I said, wow, this is a solution to that problem. How did it happen? I don't know. I don't know whether it happened to you. You go to sleep with a problem, you get up in the morning with a solution. What happened during the night? You see, your body processes information and reintegrates and tells you the solution. So I get a lot of my insights that I write about, a lot of my quote-unquote wisdom, meditation. And also I think another good benefit of it is that you calm down your thinking. You let your mind calm down. In yoga they say that our mind is our enemy, not our friend. Your mind can really take you astray. 
because it's not your mind. You think it's your mind, it's not. Because in your mind, you have impact. What your friends told you, what the television told you, what the books told you, what your parents told you, what your enemies told you. It's how much of it is yours, I don't know. So now your mind is telling you what to do, and it's not you. You find who you are in meditation, because you stop thinking. You let the thinking pass like clouds in the sky. You don't get attached. Now you're above your thoughts. That's who you really are. You find yourself. So when I have a real big problem, I say, you know what? Let me meditate on it. And my real Isaac de Adige comes up. When I'm thinking, it's not my real me. Isaac, concretely, concretely, how many times you meditate? How does it work? And I learned a very important thing that not any form of meditation matches with everybody. Look, I should meditate every day. Should. But I don't. I am very tired sometimes in the morning. I worked all night long on my book. I just, I don't do it. So what I do, like, I don't like to exercise. I don't, I don't, it's not my preference. You know, I never exercise as a child. So for me, this is a, not my normal way of doing things. I started very late in life. So what do I do? I hired somebody to be my trainer. So she comes in and says, exercise. So I have to exercise. I don't have enough my own self. In. So I get somebody else to, to get me to do it. Then I took another person that I'm teaching meditation. So every Thursday I have to teach her. So it is the third time. Then on Sunday, we have a group meditation four times. So whether I like it or not, I have to do it four times. So <laughs> I create a situation where whether I like it or not, I do it because I know it's good. So I force myself to do it. I like this practical approach in living well, because it's well, living well doesn't works. mean that it's easy to do. Whatever works. The guru said, willpower is a muscle too. <laughs> Some people have a very weak muscle. You know? When you have a weak muscle, you get help. And I get help. I'm not ashamed to say I get help because I'm not strong enough. You are very honest. I think that you inspire because you share also a sentence like, when I don't know what to do, I ask, or I involve somebody else. I mean, I'm weak in this. I'm not ashamed. Death and dream. So you are 83 years old and you do many, many things and you have an institute that has your name. What about will stay after you? You say that we are not happy to think about death because it's our limit. Is there any link between death and dream and which is a dream you really have? Instead of dream, you say mission. What is your mission? You know, where are you going? What? I'm driven by mission. My mission is to share everything I know because I can help other people sharing what they know and what they learned and what they think. Mostly what they think. You know, all my blogs that I write every Friday for the last 10 years end with the word just thinking. I don't claim to know. I don't know nothing. I'm just thinking. And if it's, if it's good, good. If it's not good, tell me why not. So we can think about it again, all over again, you know, learn, continuously learn, continuously learn, learn from disagreements. I tell people, I like people that beat me in my argument. I love people that beat me. I like to lose arguments. Why? Because I learned something. That's my mission is to spread what I know, what I developed, which is making companies a better companies. I helped companies grow from $12 million to $4 billion. And the owner is still 100% owner. To keep it to myself, I suffer. I have to share what I have. I have to give what I have because otherwise I feel like I'm abusing. God gave me some present and I have to share it. I realize things that people don't realize. I have the obligation, I have this need to share it with the world. Which is your relationship with money? Because uh, uh, you did uh, also uh, your job uh, with this talent. I can tell you, some people are poor, but they think they are rich. My wife believes she is rich. They're, they're rich people, you know, the, the, the money to them is... Like I have a friend of mine tells me, the money you have is only the money you spend. Because if you did not spend it, you actually don't have it. 
Very, very profound statement, you see. Money that you did not use, what the hell did you do with it? It's, you don't have it. It belongs to, to the bank. So the, if you spend it, now you have it because you spend it. Although I am very well paid as a consultant, very, very well paid. I think I'm one of the top consultants in the world. I'm financially very well off. My heart, I'm still poor. I'm always, oh, you know, don't spend there. Don't. I have it. I cannot spend it because of my past. I knew what it is to be poor. I knew what it is to be starving and living on 50 cents a day in New York and sleeping at the back seat of a car. I have a problem with that. But I have a dear wife that she knows how to spend. So we are, we are very well balanced. When a company asks you to quote a possible work, do you feel uncomfortable in estimating the money you want from the company? You are absolutely right. You know, when I started consulting 50 years ago, I asked for $100 a day because I was scared. $100 a day. And the guy looked at me and says, Dr. Adizis, unless you charge me $1,000, I cannot take your recommendation to the board. They're going to laugh me out of the room. So I said, okay, pay me $1,000. I didn't ask for $1,000. I was scared to ask for $1,000. Today, I get a lot. But really, I'm still underpaid because I'm always afraid to ask for more because money is such big, you know. So what I try to do is instead of taking daily rate I don't take, I said, look, pay me a monthly retainer. Let me do the best for you I can. And if you don't get your value, cancel. Don't pay. That's it. Finish. You know, so it is a monthly retainer. And then I do the best for you. If you don't get the value, thank you. And I like more also to get, not money. I like to get stock options. So if the company does well, I do well, period. So, you know, let me do the best I can for the company. The better for you, the better for me, win-win. In that case, we don't have to worry about money. Dream, I understand. Mission, you said. I like with it, you reward. You, you help me looking at the same thing with a different word. What about death? A very good question you're asking me because I've been dealing with that question a lot. Because during the Second World War, I was in coma for many, many, many days because I was scared that I'm going to die. And I was only a six-year-old kid. I used to cry all night long and scream, you know, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. As a matter of fact, I believe all my achievements, they're all because I'm scared of death. There is a book written a long time ago with Pulitzer Prize. It's called The Fear of Death. When people are scared of death, they don't live. They spend all their life denying their death. What does it mean? That when they die, they will not die. Their books will remain. Their message will remain. Their philosophy will remain. They don't want to die. And that's what is happening to me. I'm pretty sure that everything I'm doing, all the 26 books, I have 36 languages, all the lectures I'm doing, everything I'm doing is because of my fear of death, that I don't want to die. People die twice. They're born twice and they die twice. They're born twice, once when they're physically born, a second time when they realize why they were born, that the second birth. They die twice, one when they physically die, and the second time when nobody remembers them. So the way you avoid dying the second time is to leave something behind you that will live after you die. That's how I look at life. I don't want to die. I want to leave something behind me that when I physically die, I'm still around alive. Are you afraid of physical pain, suffering physically? Yes, I don't like it. Not at all. I mean, I, I can take emotional pain. I can take intellectual pain, try to solve a problem. Physical pain, not at all. I... From a very rational, so wise person, you cannot imagine to hear, as it happened to me, that in India, where you go uh, from time to time because of the meditation, you were in front of kids with uh, closed eyes that were able to read books which were there that they had never opened before. 
So I should admit that it was not easy for me to combine the professor uh, Adizes and Isako Adizes that tells me about his trip to India, where, you know, his son taped, even taped. No, it is typical of when you say something strong in general, you try to, to, to find as an argument the fact that you have something that you can show. And you, you so wise, <laughs> he told me, you know, I have my son taped it. So can you come back on this topic? Just a second. Brighter minds. The guru was telling me how he discovered it. He was visiting some place, and a little kid was telling him, Master, I can read with my feet. The master says, how can you read with your feet? Well, he put his foot on the book, and he was reading. Wow. So they developed a whole program there where children, they can do it up to, I think, to the age of 12. After 12, they cannot do it. I saw it with my own eyes. They closed my eyes with a piece of cloth and said, do you see anything? I said, no. I said, now let me show you. Took the same piece of cloth and closed the eyes of a little kid. And then they asked me, give him some money from your pocket. So I took a dollar and I gave it to him. The guy was with closed eyes. The kid was with closed eyes. Then I asked him, what do you have in your hand? He says, it's a dollar. How many? Five dollar bill. I said, wow. What is the registration number of the money has registration numbers? He read the whole number, which I think was nine, nine digits. Wow. I mean, I was, what the hell? How can we do it? Then we took a book from the shelf, opened the book in the middle. I said, read it. He read the book with closed eyes, a book he never opened. I opened it for him. So I asked him, how did you do that? And they told me that they discovered that we don't read with our eyes, we read with our brain, which means intuition. I don't know. This is such an unbelievable thing that I cannot explain it. But I have a book here that tried to explain it. I will give it my interpretation of it. It's called intuition. Don't be afraid to use your intuition. What happens, we go to school and we are learning to know 16 years of education. Then university four is 20. By the time you finish, you have 20 some years of schooling. Every year you have five, six, seven, 10 examinations. Times 12 is 120 examinations. And you have to be sure that you know every time. If you don't know, you fail. So for 20 some years, we are dreaming it our head. You have to know, you have to know, you have to know, you have to know, or you are a failure. What they're doing with little children is leave your brain alone, feel it, let your intuition tell you, you know, and this is very interesting. Sometimes you stop thinking, feel what's going on. Look at the little baby. Everybody meets a foreigner, somebody does not know. The baby looks at you. Is he thinking? No, he's feeling you. Are you a loving person or you're not a loving person? Should I laugh or should I cry? They're feeling you. As we grow and we go through education, we lose this capability to feel. We are thinking, we are evaluating, we are judging, we are not feeling what's going on. And I'm, I'm now in my age of 83, I'm trying to reverse that. I have a friend of mine, we go to walk every day for an hour. And I really learned it from the son of a gun. He has Alzheimer. He cannot think very well. But you know what he's teaching me? He says, Ichak, look at this cloud. How wonderful. This cloud was never like this in the history of mankind and will never repeat itself again. Unique cloud. I did not see the cloud. Look at this tree. I said, what tree? You know what's happening? We are too busy with the brain. Stop the bloody brain from time to time and feel, feel the cloud, feel the tree, feel your children. It's interesting what you just said, because it seems that you are promoting or asking us to imagine also a different way of our self-learning, not only when we are kids. I read somewhere a very interesting statement. An ignorant that believes he is wise 
is ignorant. A wise person that believes he's ignorant is wise. I believe I'm very ignorant. I all the time say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I learned this when I got my PhD from Columbia University. I got my diploma in my hand and I was walking down the corridor and I was very arrogant. My God, I made it. I made it. I got my doctorate and the doors for one of the classes opened up. And this was students that were taking their examination to pass the qualifying exam. And after that, if they pass, they can start writing their dissertation. So they were about two years behind me, maximum two years behind me. I, in my arrogancy, holding my diploma in my hand, I said, show me the exam, please. You know, I was trying to show them, you know, how superior I am. And I looked at the exam and I realized I would have failed the exam. The day I got my PhD, I was already obsolete. What does it mean? Never claim that you know. The real learning is lifetime learning. In my institute, we give certificates. It does not say completed his education. It say allowed to continue his education. Education should never stop. You know what they do with my children? Usually little children, you read them stories when they go to sleep, right? I do something else. What did you learn today? And we discuss, what did you learn today? Women. How we can make a step further in this issue, like relationship between men and women, respecting really specificities we have. I said before that the future of mankind is the heart, not the brain. The successful company of the future is the one that has a heart, that takes care of really the customer. Like a good restaurant. I saw in the restaurant a big sign. We will not feed you food we don't give our children. And I said to myself, if you love me as much as you love your children, I'm your customer. I want to eat your food. So now look, who works from the heart? The women. Who works with feeling? The women. Women work with brain and heart. First of all, they feel what's going on. Then they think about it. So in my judgment, the future of civilization now, my dear friend, whether we men like it or not, is women. Women are going to take over the world, whether we like it or not. We don't like it. You know, we want to dominate. We want to dominate. Our time is over. Our time, the more we fight it, the more we will lose. It is their time now. It's a change of guards. And now our role is to be supportive of them. Their role has changed. It's not the same role they used to have. So they have the time and the energy to take over the world, which they could not have done before. So we really have to be, have to recognize that the future, the dominance is going to be female dominance. By the way, I'm not talking about just women. It could be a man, which is female. It's a female energy that I'm talking about. For the homosexuals, it's a female energy. So the female energy is taking over the world and we have to accept it. And we have to learn how to live with it and we know how to become supportive of. Who will cry when you die? That's a very interesting question. That's a very good question. I know my family will cry, but I want to go beyond that because I don't exist only that. So I hope any people that learn from me, they would like, but I know something, I hope they don't cry. Instead of cry, I hope they will read my books and continue learning. I felt very honored and enriched at the end of this conversation. How did you go through these conversations, uh, this dialogue today? I'm as good as the interviewer. You know, it is like in art. If you perform in Broadway, you do much better than if you perform in Peoria, Illinois. You were asking very good questions. You stimulated me. And because you stimulated me, I started clarifying even more and better what my thoughts are. So I thank you for helping me clarify my own thoughts.